Hey everyone, we are working our way through James Tour's latest failure pile of a YouTube series. Let's continue doing that, shall we? In my previous series, I took Jim's obsession with the word hype and showed that it's just a buzzword he uses to deny science he doesn't like, much like other Discovery Institute charlatans. They do one little thing and then they extrapolate it, and then they work with the press to ramp it up even more, and they project as if they really know it. And let's talk about some of these early hominins and some of the hype that has gone uh, on surrounding them. Not only is this profoundly lazy, but it also makes him a hypocrite, as it applies to him as well. Everyone has to get grants, even James. Let's see how James hypes up his research to get funding. Take a look at this publication from March 26, 2001 in Chemical and Engineering News. Chemistry, you gotta sell it. Do you, James? Do you have to sell it? Shouldn't it stand on its own merit? Quick aside, James counts this as a scientific publication on his CV, even though it does not count in any scientific circles. That's called padding the resume. He does this a lot. Here are a few other highlights, which include a rant for a Christian science book, a blog post for Discovery Institute, and his numerous childish essays for Inference Review, a journal which is not peer-reviewed. James knows that making YouTube videos instead of publishing papers makes him totally irrelevant, and he hates being reminded of this fact, since it shows how incompetent he is in this area. So he regularly pretends that he has published on this topic. Topic. People say, why don't you just write papers about this? I have. I've written five papers about this. People ignore them. These garbage essays are what he's talking about. As I showed in the Casey Luskin debunk, this pseudo-journal was started in part by David Berlinski of Discovery Institute for the express purpose of passing off their propaganda as real science, and it states outright on the website that it is not peer-reviewed. Again, none of these count as scientific publications, James, so when you present them as such to seem like more of a big shot, that's called hype. You know what else it's called? Lying. Isn't that supposed to be a big no-no for such a good, pure Christian? I'm a sinner. Sorry, we got a little sidetracked. James lies so much that it's tough to stay focused. It's not just his fake papers we were talking about, it's his real research too. Have you ever hyped up your research, James? In the last 10 years, you've been working almost exclusively on applications of graphene, starting companies and filing patents. This material has been around for 20 years and was promised to revolutionize life as we know it. Have you revolutionized the world yet, James? Some people would say, that's a lot of hype. You know, just like you say about origin of life research, to the point that you have publicly called for the halting of the entire field. I think that the way we're doing it is so wrong, it's just got to stop, radically stop. It's getting us nowhere. And I say we have something akin to a DARPA challenge. What DARPA does is when they have it, the, the community is stuck on solving something. So they have DARPA challenge. They don't invite in any of the old guys who've been working on this for 40 years. They want young, fresh minds on this. 60 years of breakthroughs is not enough for him. Just look at this timeline highlighting the most important research of the past decade alone. Are you up to speed on all this? Well, I have news for you, James. There are people who think graphene research is full of hype. What do you think? Should we dig a little deeper? What's the global market for graphene after all this research? A hundred some odd million a year. For context, the global market for aspirin is well over two billion a year. Doesn't sound very promising to me. What do you think? Should we put a stop to all graphene research and form a new team because you just can't seem to get it right? Why can't you bring about all those revolutionary applications we were promised, James? Flash graphene changing the world. Let's see what else. You make little nano cars, right? What are the applications of your nano machines in real life? Anything groundbreaking or just, ooh, look at this neat thing I made? Maybe you shouldn't get to do that research anymore either. Maybe we should form a DARPA team of younger, smarter, better researchers who can follow through on these promising areas. After all, a Nobel Prize was bestowed on the first graphene team, not you, and another for molecular machines, again, not you, and several Nobel laureates have worked on origin of life research. Like Jack Shostak, who you are unfortunately acquainted with due to the egregious slander you continue to commit, as well as Eigen, Yuri, probably more. 
To those watching who are incapable of detecting sarcasm, I am not in fact saying that James should stop his research. He can research whatever the hell he wants, even if he's not doing anything even remotely groundbreaking. But for him to call for the halting of an entire field of research he doesn't understand just because it makes him uncomfortable is ludicrous and disgusting and unethical. Or what's a better word? I'm rather nefarious. Yes, that's perfect. It's nefarious, James. You are regularly being nefarious. Most of the hype you are referring to is just good science, and the little bit of hype that exists is shared in common with literally every other field of science, including everything you do yourself. So drop the act. Now, pivoting back to all the science James doesn't understand, it's time to talk about one of his absolute favorite subjects to humiliate himself with, peptides. This is a meaty one, so let's get some context. In my original video, I caught him saying something unbelievably stupid. First of all, we don't know how to build the molecules, the four classes of molecules that are needed for it. I responded by pointing out how stupid this is, and that we routinely make all of these biomolecules in the lab, and it is totally trivial. Not being happy about having this lie exposed, he replied with two completely contradictory responses. Well, first of all, every video where I've spoken on this has been a video on abiogenesis. The questions were abiogenesis, so when you pull one sentence out of context, yeah, you're going to get that. Of course, he can pretend to have been taken out of context, but then why also say this? Any biomolecule that's easy to synthesize is as wrong as wrong can be. That is probably the most wrong statement in that entire video that we're looking at. That is the most wrong statement. Any synthetic chemist is going to probably just be getting up out of their chair right now because their palpitations cause them to collapse on the ground. To hear a statement, any biomolecule is easy to synthesize. Of course, I pointed out how idiotic it was for him to say both of those things and specified that it is indeed trivial from a practical standpoint to make these molecules with the touch of a button, not that the science behind it isn't incredible. Then he started raving like a lunatic about how complicated laboratory synthesis is and how impossible it is to make peptides in water, not only prebiotically, but in general, harping on an image from my original video showing aqueous peptide formation without any mechanism specified since my first video was for lay people. I don't understand why some would suggest that you do condensation reactions in an ocean like this, uh, in water. How can that be? Tell me about that. How do you do condensation reactions in water? Have you any references on these claims? In my response, I showed him a bunch of papers that outline many plausible mechanisms for aqueous amino acid polymerization to yield peptides all with prebiotic relevance. In his latest series, To Respond, Mr. Dave Can't Read Papers reads none of the papers and continues to whine about how you can't make peptides in water. Peptide synthesis in water is not a problem, James. Dave thinks making peptides in water is no problem. The thermodynamics, kinetics, not a problem. You're going to get these things. Again, James, I showed a lot of research to back that up, which you're ignoring, because you don't want your viewers to know how objectively wrong you are. You could have admitted you were wrong like a big boy, but no, you have to insist on your infallibility and my cluelessness. And rather than to learn something, he just has to dig in his heels, because if he should ever, if he should ever show that he's just a little bit wrong, I mean, for James Tour to eat humble pie, never, never. He will just dig in his heels forever on this thing. So what's his angle to get out of this mess? Have you any references on these claims? Uh-oh, someone didn't do his homework. Peptide synthesis in water is not a problem, James, because it is not a matter of equilibrium. So he says it's not a matter of equilibrium, but now we've got thermodynamics. Doesn't thermodynamics talk about the equilibrium? That's right. Cut the video off before I give you all the references. Just vaguely gesture at thermodynamics. That's quite hilarious since you've demonstrated on numerous occasions that when it comes to proteins and thermodynamics, you sound like a cocky undergrad flexing new knowledge but failing miserably. The proteins have, have this enormous, they don't have an enormous half-life. I mean, an amide bond has a half-life in water of, of seven years, which is not long. That's the twinkling of an eye. That's per amide. That means a protein that's, say, a 400 mer has a half-life uh, in water of, I don't know, a few days or a week. That's it.
What in the sweet hell are you saying, James? First of all, it's really cute that you learned something from my previous video, where I had to tell you what the half-life of a peptide bond is, but how can you run with that and say something this stupid? First of all, seven years isn't long enough for what? Does a molecule have to hang out for a billion years to be prebiotically relevant? But then you say, because there are many amide bonds, the protein has a half-life of a few days? Seriously? James, decomposition kinetics are not a bell curve of probabilities. It takes, on average, seven years to break a peptide bond any peptide bond, and once broken, the peptide is gone. The peptide is stable for seven years. You don't even have to know any science whatsoever to understand how stupid James sounds right here. We are made of proteins. If proteins fell apart in days, then life couldn't exist, Einstein. It's like when you do these little religious podcasts, your brain leaks out and you get even dumber so you can briefly match the intelligence of your congregation. Well, folks, once again, it's time to teach James a little science. Okay, James, hopefully you remember that chemical reactions we observe are usually exergonic, which means they are associated with a release of Gibbs free energy going from reactants to products. A synonym for exergonic is that favorite word of yours, spontaneous, which you pretend to not know the definition of. Again, this word spontaneously here is a code word for we have no idea. So, despite some reaction being spontaneous, it still must overcome the activation energy, which is a kinetic barrier, but once that happens, the products will form. Now, Jim's big gotcha, or so he thinks, is that condensation reactions between a carboxylic acid and an amine are endergonic, or non-spontaneous, with a large activation barrier, and equilibrium favors hydrolysis over condensation, which means starting materials over products. So this totally can't happen ever, right? No, nature chose to activate a carboxylic acid using chemical energy. This activated version can now condense with the amine, and it will be exergonic, or spontaneous, similar to how enzymes work. The activation barrier for hydrolysis of the peptide is very high, so even in boiling water, the peptide is not hydrolyzed. Equilibrium is never reached, and indeed, proteins are stable in water, otherwise life would not exist. Got it so far, James? Equilibrium favoring hydrolysis doesn't matter. If it did, proteins wouldn't be stable and life would not exist. Can you wrap your head around that? So clearly, prebiotic nature must have found a solution to this problem. Proteins were almost certainly made in water, so how did it happen? Well, again, in my previous series, I highlighted a lot of research outlining ways it could have happened, and James is ignoring all of it. There are two ways to do it. First, direct condensation, which requires that water be removed from the equilibrium. That's why I talked about wet-dry cycling, which has been examined by many researchers, not just Lee Cronin. And when James tries to reference my interview with Lee, where he is talking about this topic, he has nothing intelligent to say about it whatsoever. He just calls it nonsense and moves along. His justification is the high temperature. Well, what he does, you look at the experimental. Now, Dave, you got, you got to look at the experimental to see this. His hot cycle is 130 degrees centigrade. That's 266 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 hours. To sterilize, to sterilize something, you heat it up to 121 degrees centigrade, 250 degrees Fahrenheit. He is at sterilization temperature. You're going to form life under these conditions? Wow, that is really a harsh place. It's too hot, he says. Why is it too hot, James? Too hot for what? This could have been happening in a hot spring. Those things are really hot. Too hot for life? Well, that's fine because nothing was alive yet, genius. This process does not instantly form an amoeba. This is an early step in abiogenesis. We are talking about mechanisms for getting the biomacromolecules together for the first time. Remember how abiogenesis took at least 100 million years and wasn't just some molecules floating together and coming alive in an instant, as you pretend it's supposed to be, so you can vomit up that why can't you make life in a lab straw man that is your last resort 
Resort escape hatch. It was hot and peptides formed. It's not that hard to understand. Is this really the best you can do, James? Oh wait, actually you can do much worse. Apart from pretending Lee's work is stupid, you also pretend he agrees with you and that peptides do not form in bulk water. So your own expert, Lee Cronin, comes on, shows a paper, and it agrees with me, and Dave, you didn't even know it. You didn't even know it. He agrees with me. These things don't form. Unfavorable kinetics and thermodynamics. He is not saying what you are pretending he is saying, James. Nobody is suggesting that amino acids should just couple in bulk water precisely as they are. Nature goes on the free amino acids, just like you showed on your picture, just like I said it can't happen. Again, with this total straw man, I never suggested that amino acids should just float together and form a peptide. We are talking about different methods of activation. Lee studies this. He does not agree with you in your assessment that his research is illegitimate. This is right on par with your quote mining of Matthew Pounder that I pointed out in my previous series. How many times are you going to pretend that origin of life researchers are debunking origin of life research? Aren't you ashamed of this unbelievable dishonesty? I'm a sinner. Now, to describe this second method of aqueous peptide formation, I presented many papers regarding chemical activation. You ignored all of them. Have you any references on these claims? Multiple times, James plays the clip where I'm about to scroll through references regarding chemical activation in aqueous solution, and he just cuts me off. Uh-oh, someone didn't do his homework. Peptide synthesis in water is not a problem, James, because it is not a matter of equilibrium. He bets I don't have any papers on this, but sorry, I have many. Here are just a few. You see that my complaint can't have your viewers seeing those papers, eh, James? Well, let's take a look at them again, plus some more. Here's one, diamidophosphate, or DAP. Despite Jim's fallacious claim that this reagent is not prebiotically relevant, which we will debunk in the next video, this has been proposed as a universal activator even for nucleotides and lipids. As you can read for yourself, peptides form in water at room temperature. Whoops. Here's one from 2004 using carbonyl sulfide as an activator. Again, mild conditions with an aqueous buffer at room temperature. You can see the yields they get, which are pretty high under some conditions. Again, in water. Here's one using carbon disulfide as the activator. Again, in aqueous buffers at room temperature. Here's another one postulating activation by sulfur dioxide, which was abundant on the Hadean Earth. Again, peptides forming in water. How about this one, cyanate and nitrogen oxides, in water at slightly elevated temperature like a hot spring would provide. Here's another one, trimetaphosphate as an activator. This reaction works in neutral water at room temperature. James, stop bringing up peptides like it's some sort of slam dunk for you. You are humiliating yourself. You whine about how I can't read papers when you don't even bother to check what they say. Amino acid condensation in water is not a problem with chemical activation. This is an experimental fact. You are denying reality as usual. Of course, if James were forced to respond to this, we can all predict what he would say. He would resort to his pathetic script of goalpost shifting. They bought the amino acids in antihumerically pure. How do they become homochiral? Well, we already talked about that totally separate and unrelated question quite a bit, now didn't we? Or what about the side chains? But when you have active side chains, these compete for the reaction sites. Fine, a fair question, one which is actively being worked on by many chemists, which you didn't seem to know. Here's another relevant study. This one proposes the intermediacy of thioamino acids. The coupling is preceded by thiol dimerization to disulfide, and then the coupling is intramolecular. They got good yields, even with lysine residues. Pretty neat, huh, James? Somehow I bet you don't like it much. But anyway, what do you think happened? When God nudged amino acids together with wizard powers, he just protected all the side chains with his fingers? Great alternative. But not to get sidetracked, these tangents James would desperately point to are totally separate research questions. They have nothing to do with the thermodynamics of peptide formation in water, which is not a problem. Do you understand, James, finally? Huh? 
But of course for James, it's never the end. He needs to pretend that my experts agree with him. So he wants to call them incompetent, which they aren't, but then also pretend that they agree with him, which they don't. In general, he always desperately wants to pretend that scientists agree with him, so he has to come up with a devious way to do so. Here comes James the Big Shot with his friend the peptide chemist. I sent this to a friend of mine who is a peptide chemist. This guy has been studying and making peptides for years, and I say, d d tell me, do I have this wrong? I mean, how can he be saying he's making peptides? So James asks him if Lee's study is a good way to make peptides. Like, as good as modern synthetic techniques, a peptide chemist like him would be familiar with, which was not the point of the study. At all. His friend says it's interesting, but not a great way to make peptides and nobody cares. The peptide chemist said that. About the study, which is not about how to most efficiently make peptides. It's all right here in the text he shows. That's how stupid his viewers are. He can show the full text and pretend it means whatever he wants it to mean, and his viewers just nod their heads. Look, it says it is not practical for anything. Of course it's not practical. This is not how a chemist would or should make peptides. It's a way that nature could have made them by blind chance. Why should it have practical application? Look, he even says outside of investigations of prebiotic chemistry, no one cares. Of course they don't. This study is an investigation of prebiotic chemistry. Why should it be relevant outside of the thing that it is? I doubt anyone cares. Lee, nobody cares. Nobody cares about this except YouTubers who can't read the papers and see that you've made a bunch of junk. No, James, he made peptides in a way that's prebiotically relevant. And when you get like this, where you look like you're about to pop a blood vessel, it's because the realization that your entire worldview is a joke is slowly sinking in. And the half of you that's hiding from that fact gets really upset about it. Anyway, the rest of what James says about Lee in this series is a load of bullshit. I needed money to build robots to search for the origin of life, and no one would give me any money for that. It's like, ah, oh, no, 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 I'm gonna make drugs for you instead, then you can get money. So what he does is he tells the funding agencies, I'll make drugs for you, and then he can get his money. That's how he gets his money to explore origin of life. Jim Tour is the nefarious one. So he needs to make drugs to get money for his robots, so he makes the drugs and gets the money for the robots. What are you complaining about, James? Would this be a little nefarious bit of character assassination? The way he handles research money has zero effect on the validity of his claims. Then here's a clip of Lee explaining some research. What does James reply with? Lee, your molybdenum oxide, your rust, is a bunch of nonsense. It is not life. It does not move toward life. You're getting autocatalysis, something that was shown by Oswald more than 100 years ago. And you're not making houses and skyscrapers. There's some more loose talk because people think that, wow, he's built skyscrapers like this. No, he's making micron-sized particles at best. Micron-sized particles. That's right. A bunch of nonsense. It's not life and does not move toward life. It's a catalyst, genius. And then he whines about the skyscrapers. He's not building skyscrapers, you guys. It's small micron-sized things. Do you not know what an analogy is, James? He is talking about molecules that self-perpetuate. He is demonstrating a principle of nature that is relevant to origin of life. He is not claiming to have made life. There's nothing there. He's just doing some autocatalysis on an inorganic complex. It has absolutely nothing to do with life absolutely nothing to do with life. What's this? Autocatalysis has absolutely nothing to do with life? Uh-oh, we get to the primary area of origin of life research that James really hates, does not understand in the slightest, and wishes would go away by just calling it nonsense. Let's see how I had explained autocatalysis and compare that to the explanation of Dave Farina's expert. So I described autocatalysis in my video briefly because I don't think it had a whole lot to do with this. And we'll show other so-called experts in origin of life totally debunk this whole autocatalysis being the, the end-all be-all. But in any case, before we get to that, here's how I had described autocatalysis that really upset Dave. 
Another dramatic demonstration of Jim's cluelessness arrives when he attempts to discuss autocatalysis. You see, this is a phenomenon that synthetic chemists don't deal with because it is rarely encountered in traditional synthetic chemistry, which explains why he doesn't know anything about it. But bless his little heart, he sure tries his best. Autocatalytic means that a reaction makes something, and that something that it's made becomes a catalyst for, for the next structure to be made. Apart from this being a totally unsatisfactory and incomplete definition, he literally just moves on as though there's nothing else to say. Why? Because he knows it is a core concept for origin of life, thus it is in his best interest to ignore it, and he also has no ability to speak about it in an even remotely sophisticated way. That's the way I describe autocatalysis, which he says is a core concept. We're, we're going to get to that when we start talking about uh, the things that Davis said. Yes, you fumbled the definition and then redirected because you do not want to acknowledge that this is a core concept since you're clueless about it. And now you're cutting away from my video, neglecting to show the part where I explain in great detail what autocatalysis is, and then proceed to cite about a dozen papers by important figures in the field like Gerald Joyce, demonstrating selection at the molecular level among sets of biomolecules that are absolutely Absolutely pivotal for showing how life could have begun. Great job, James. You really know how to address the science. But let's see how uh, Dave's expert Lee Cronin explains autocatalysis and compare that to my explanation. Now, there's a special type of catalyst called an autocatalyst. So it's a catalyst that makes itself. Do you see the difference, James? Lee said a catalyst that makes itself because of the prefix auto from Greek meaning self. Hence, self-replication. That's not what you said. You said a catalyst for the next structure to be made, because you don't know what you're talking about, or you conveniently left the important part out because you don't want your viewers to know that we have produced self-replicating molecules outside of a living system, since that sounds suspiciously relevant to the origin of life. Once again, for clarity, an autocatalytic reaction is a single chemical reaction for which one of the products also catalyzes the reaction. An autocatalytic cycle is a sequence of reactions that, once completed, results in two or more copies of the molecule type that was started with, like the foremost reaction. An autocatalytic set is a set of reactions and molecules such that these molecules mutually catalyze each other's formation using only reactions from the set. All of these explanations are in this paper that I showed you last time, and they are still here for you to read when you decide you're ready to actually learn something about this topic. Anyway, Jim's obsession with Lee Cronin, as bizarre as it is, doesn't hold a candle to the stunt he tried to pull regarding Bruce Lipschitz. So let's move on to that. For example, he brings in Bruce Lipschitz of UC Santa Barbara as one of his experts. He says, Bruce Lipschitz is commenting on my video where I talked about protein synthesis being impossible in water, that protein synthesis doesn't happen in water. Interestingly enough, Bruce Lipschitz is a friend of mine. I have known him for 35 years, more than 35 years, almost 40 years I've known Bruce. Bruce said he never saw my video. He had sent Dave his video on some other topic. He was not responding to the video that I had done. But Dave put it in there as if it was from me. But Dave calls me a liar. I'm not gonna say anything about Dave, but interestingly enough, Bruce didn't even know it was put in there. We'll look at that in detail. So, James claims to be super best pals with Bruce because they were at a conference together once. As for me, I've known Bruce since I spent a summer in his lab as an undergraduate. It doesn't matter who's closer to Bruce, this is not a popularity contest, but I mentioned to him the absurd parade of science denial James was enacting, and I asked him to contribute a clip to my response for a section regarding peptide chemistry. I thought it would make an impact to have someone in the same field as James show how he's getting this aspect of the science wrong, and that making peptides in water is not a problem. 
After his clip, I explained very clearly that the specific methodology he uses in his lab is not prebiotically relevant since he's not an origin of life researcher, but that it doesn't matter. We are simply talking about thermodynamics. Remember, James, you welcomed corrections from your colleagues. You love to play the humble card. I really want the synthetic chemists, my synthetic chemist colleagues, to critique me. Uh, is there something that I'm teaching in here that's synthetically incorrect? Let me know. Bruce chimed in to show how, with peptides, James was wrong. This doesn't put Bruce in anyone's camp, but James totally lost his mind. He then takes 20 minutes to explain how Bruce's methodology isn't prebiotically relevant when I had outright stated that myself, and he even played the clip of me saying so, knowing that no one would notice. The whole section is just more irrelevant flexing, his favorite pastime. Of course, this was all because his followers won't listen to anything I say or acknowledge any of the science I reference. Much better out of the mouth of a chemist, yeah? Maybe James will listen to a colleague, yeah? But instead, James flipped out, started talking about betrayal, are you in my camp or his camp, emailing Bruce endlessly to fish for something he could use in his response. So they had an extended exchange where Bruce is pretty clearly trying to stay out of things and being overly cordial, but James is going nuts, insisting I'm some kind of demon who tricked Bruce, used his clip without him knowing what it was for, and that I was hell-bent on smearing his name for my own malicious ambitions. He brought on three experts. Two of them knew that they were bring, being brought on. One of them didn't even know it. He just took one of the guy's videos and stuck it in as if he was... And I know this because that so-called ex expert is a friend of mine. And told me, he said, what do you mean I'm on a video? And he had no idea. So anyway, all of that will be exposed. This is idiotic, since Bruce is responding directly to something James said, but of course James puts on an Oscar-worthy performance, and his followers eat it up. Since James chopped up the email thread to suit his narrative, I'll show you the actual exchange, which Bruce was gracious enough to send me. Here is James responding to Bruce's initial reply piecemeal. Look at this. Dave asked me to comment on some of your writings. He obviously misspoke and meant the video. This was all about the peptides and water thing from his video. That's all. Whether he actually watched the video or not, I don't know. Maybe he didn't. I just told him what James said and requested a comment. He says he does not want to take sides, as in he is not on Jim's side. He says that the clip would not be used against him, as James is claiming it is. Of course, James is pulling that out of his ass. It wasn't used against him at all. He's just mad that a colleague is speaking up about this. Now we get to the parts James conveniently left out. In fairness to Dave, I only sent the comment because we are indeed doing peptide synthesis in water. Of course, James doesn't like it. He brings up the hydrophobic pockets specific to Bruce's methodology, but that have nothing whatsoever to do with any of the other research I referenced in my previous response, as well as this one, which involve prebiotically plausible chemical activators. Bruce goes on to specify, in my view, peptides have been made throughout evolution, and then takes a little jab at James, knowing that he hates evolution because Jesus. James plays dumb and shifts the goalposts. Then Bruce goes on to essentially describe some origin-of-life concepts that aren't even part of his field, but align perfectly with everything I've said in all of my content, specifying that protecting groups were not needed. Like clockwork, James shifts the goalposts again by bringing up homochirality, and it goes on like this. Bruce continually states things like, this is how nature did it, and there is no equilibrium to discuss, and James ignores it, just throwing in phrases like, we agree, for no reason, knowing that later he's going to chop this email up to make it look like Bruce agrees with him. He doesn't. Even in the tidbits James chooses to show, it explicitly states that Bruce knew what he was saying and that he knew what I was using the clip for. He just doesn't highlight it and his idiot followers don't read anything. They only listen to his lies. Bruce's subsequent comments to me when providing the original email exchange clarify his confusion. He acknowledges that James is twisting the tone of the exchange and explicitly states that James is missing the point. But hey, emails aren't good enough for you? Let's hear from Bruce in person one more time. And yes, James, Bruce knows I'm using this clip and what it's for. So I'd like to respond to the situation that apparently I've been brought into 
uh, with regard to this notion of making peptides in water. First of all, I was asked by Dave Farina to make a video, which I did. And I think it's an accurate statement to simply say that, of course, I gave him permission to use that video in whatever capacity he felt it would be helpful. At the same time, I wrote various emails to James Tour, and no, I did not give him formal permission to use them, but that's okay. The fact that he used them for his purposes in terms of what I had said, I have no problem with that. Even to the extent that those were used selectively in redacted form for various reasons, that's okay. I, I, I don't have a problem with that either. So that I think is uh, the first point. The second point is therefore, I, I, I don't understand why because of doing these two things that it comes across that I'm aligned with either party. I'm not, I'm aligned with the science the science that we do, the chemistry and water that we do, which I'll comment on in a moment. But I think it's unfair, uh, certainly to me, as I at least perceive it, that I'm in anyone's particular camp. I'm not. <laughs> I, I, I don't know where that came from. Uh, I don't think I ever said it. I, I'm not sure, but I don't think so. And I hope that uh, this corrects maybe a misunderstanding, miscommunication that we had. So no one went behind my back. Nobody did anything wrong necessarily uh, in terms of usage of what I had already created. Uh, but I just want to set the record straight. Now, lastly, uh, I want to make a comment about the science. That's why I say, how, how do we think about this peptide bond formation through time? Did such species exist back then? Uh, absolutely, Ab absolutely. It's what we would call dirty water. There were things in the water. Nobody believes the water was pristine. There was all kinds of things in the water and not just salts. So is it possible? Yes, it's possible. And I think people are now showing that it's possible to do this sort of chemistry in this um, prebiotic mix or soup or whatever one wants to think of it, however one wants to think of it. So anyway, that's, uh, that's my two cents worth. And that's my involvement is purely from the scientific standpoint and the fact that we're looking to do chemistry and water. So I hope this has been helpful to somebody. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure who, but uh, that's, my, that's my take on it. So thank you for listening. There you have it. He knew precisely what my clip was for and gave me permission to use it that way. Though rather tellingly, he does not say the same for his emails with James. He's not in anyone's camp, and he acknowledges the validity of the peptide chemistry I've been describing and its prebiotic relevance. What do you have to say for yourself, Jimbo? I'm, 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 I'm the one who's nefarious, I'm told. They tell me I'm nefarious. Nefarious. Yes, which means You're evil nefarious. and wicked. <laughs> really? Yes. I'm a sinner. Wow, your little stunt just backfired right in your lying face, now didn't it, James? It's really adorable that you forgive Bruce. Fortunately for you, it sounds like he's going to forgive you for the way you tried to portray him as aligned with your desperate tirade of science denial. As for your blindly devoted fans, that remains to be seen. I'll see y'all in part three.